powerhouse female social activists is the wonderful Connie Butler, who many of you may remember moderated another event for us at the Marciano Museum. Connie has had the most distinguished of careers in uh, the art and museum world. She started out at MOCA, then she went to MoMA. She was responsible for the 2007 WAC show on feminism, which was the most incredible show. And she is now the chief curator at the Hammer Museum. So it is my pleasure to introduce and start the program with Connie Butler. Thank you, Shelley, and I want to say thank you to Angela Nazarian um, and to all of you visionary women. Uh, it's a wonderful organization, and also thanks to Jeffrey Deich, wherever he is. It's really thrilling to be able to be here and see the exhibition almost first, I think. So um, I am not going to go into great detail about these ladies because I think a lot of sort of biography and resume and experience and so on is going to come out as we talk, but I'm really um, very proud, actually, to call both of them my friends and colleagues, I would say. Um, we have all known each other uh, a rather long time, but definitely since the 90s, and that's kind of where we're going to start, in fact, is with our respective experiences um, here in Los Angeles. But before I say that, I just want to say I am also going to claim them for the Hammer Museum because we're honoring Judy Chicago at our gala this year, which is extremely <laughs> exciting. So um, I hope you all come. Uh, if you don't already have tickets. And Andrea, we're really thrilled. We're going to host her um, survey exhibition, which is being organized by the MCA Chicago in about two years. So that's just uh, <laughs> new news. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled about all of that. Uh, Judy set the agenda, no big surprise, for this evening's conversation. <laughs> Uh, and wanted to start, I think rightly, with um, kind of a retrospective look at our, our, each of our experiences of the LA art world. And I was thinking that, um, remembering that I think when I first met you, Judy, was when I was researching the WAC exhibition and we met in your hotel room in Santa Monica, perhaps, on a visit. You were here on a visit from New Mexico. And Andrea was a, uh, a working up and coming artist in LA at that time. Um, but I remember you saying to me, uh, giving me your blessing to organize that exhibition. And um, I mean, first of all, look where we are today, which is very different than the conversation we were having at that time, which after you gave me your blessing, you were kind of like, yeah, I don't know, sure, go ahead. I don't know if this is gonna work. I look forward to seeing what you do. And um, with that blessing, and you were my, my queen of feminist art at the moment, um, and I needed your blessing to do that show. Anyway, I was just recalling that moment. So think back to your own history here in LA and um, you know, begin where you like. I don't know if you want to begin in the CalArts years and talk about that, which you yes. share that history or share a history with Andrea in that way, but maybe reflect back on that well, starting in those say, years. When were you born? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. After Come you, on, Andrea. Andrea. Huh? After me, right? Long after, after you, me, yeah. right? Well, no, right. You were born right around the, just oh. right before me. Right? Yeah, right. I was born in 1939. <laughs> remember? I'm 80. I'm teasing you. <laughs> I just turned 80. Yeah, I just, yeah. Like, let's take a pause. <laughs> um, I, I was interested in talking about what our respective experiences. Mm -hmm were coming into the LA art scene. Because, you know, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, oh, have things changed? You know. So, um, <laughs> Connie wanted me to start, but actually I realized when I was coming over in the car that I really wanted to know, because I don't know what it was like for you when you entered the LA art scene in the 90s, right? Which was almost 30 years after I did. So why don't you start? about that, because <laughs> it addresses the issue about change right yeah, off the bat. I mean, so at CalArts, I mean, one of the reasons I went there was because of this famous, well, they accepted me. Um, <laughs> it was one, it had this famous feminist art program, you know, and people like Suzanne Lacey, who's here tonight, was one of the first, Judy started the feminist art program, and it was the first feminist art program in the United States. 
And it started in Fresno for one year, is that correct, year you two? Half. Year and a half, and then it moved to CalArts. Yeah. And so I had been working in New York. I was, I was pretty young, I was like 25. And when I got there, I spent my whole, I realized that all we studied were men. We hardly studied any women artists. And there were a lot of powerful, I thought, I had a lot of powerful like women peers that were studying with me, but I couldn't sort of find this history. And I was trying to like struggle between the history of conceptualism and the history of feminism as Suzanne, I've talked a lot about Suzanne, with Suzanne about this. And also there was a lot of, a lot, like, the discourse was very much like if, like I took Michael Asher critique classes and they could last for two or three days and you were not allowed to bring your emotions in the classroom. And this like, right? So like, you know, so I, I just, I felt like it, there was still a lot of inequality within that system and I was always saddened. And that was, and then I taught there later for two and a half years and that's when my students did that. Um, remember, there's a series of talks that brought the, a lot of feminist talks. Didn't that grow out of finding the feminist art archives in the dump? Well, that's the like rumor. That. Yeah. That's the rumor is that actually, I believe it's like I don't know if this is true, but I heard that the the feminist archives were thrown out by the super shop dumpster, and they were picked up and took to Otis. And I think that's what makes the collection at Otis. So it was this real, I think, patriarchal like destruction <laughs> of a erasure. history, yeah. erasure of a history. And so um, CalArts had come to me recently and asked me to do something, to make something, and I said, I am. I am happy to make something, you know, to, as a fundraiser, like a multiple, and they're like, how can we help you? And I was like, give me all of the names of the original women in the feminist art program. Who were the students? And they gave me a list that was women like 10 to 15 years later. It wasn't even the right time. So then I sent, so then I, I wrote you, and then we started writing Suzanne, and we've been trying to build this list. And I also asked a student who was there at the time. Nancy Youngwood. Yeah. From Go uh, well, but Gosha, who worked for Suzanne Vielmetter, who used to work for Suzanne Vielmetter, and she photographed every page of the archive for me at CalArts. It's in two, fi two files is all that's left, two file boxes. And so I just started reaching out you know, I just, I care about this stuff. Like, I just want to know who they were. I worry about this history. So Judy and I have, and, and have become closer just like asking these questions and her telling me to reach out to people. And it's just sort of a, an email list that started. I, I sort of thought Sarah Thornton should write about it once I figure out like what to do with all the art, with these conversations. But it's crazy. It's like, oh yeah, well what about so-and-so? She left halfway through. She was like dating Jim Morrison. Like the stories are amazing. But I'm just, I care about that history and I'm just trying. And so that's how you and I st started talking about this and thinking about what are the similarities in conceptualism and, and feminism? What are the differences? Well, I mean, you've written about the program and I've worked with Suzanne so closely, so I feel like I've gotten a sense of it, but I feel like so much of it has been erased or hidden or, you know, in and a way. What about when you started, what about when you started showing in LA? What, what was that like when you first kind of made your professional de debut? I don't know, I mean, it seemed like there was still, oh, I mean, you know, we felt, we felt so lucky to have been the generation after you all, like all the women feminist artists. And I called myself a feminist. That was like at a time when there was this post-feminist thing, when like oh, yeah, feminism yeah. was a bad word. Passé. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it felt really unequal to me, but we were always being told that like, like I had in Germany, I had, I was in a group show and a, the curator told me, you know, feminism happened, it's over. You don't need to talk about these things anymore. So like, you know, we felt so much better off than you all, 
but at the same time, we couldn't acknowledge our, we were almost afraid to acknowledge our own inequities, if that makes sense, I don't know. I also would say as a, as a curator and an art historian coming up at that time, and I remembered the two Manila file boxes or files or whatever at CalArts because you I was researching them. them. Right? I yeah. went through them and I was like, you're kidding me, this is all that's left. But also, we had never seen any of this work in person. And, and mm -hmm. that was what was so incredible too. There was this kind of appetite for a history that actually didn't exist. That we knew, I mean, it existed in the basements of museums, but it wasn't on view. We had never seen your work, so many, you know, Suzanne's work, many of the artists of your peers. We hadn't seen any of it in person and very little of it in reproduction. So I, I always felt like part of the reason that I even wanted to organize that show at that time, and I started working on it in the late 1990s, was to materialize something, make a history, and make a show that you had to make it if you wanted to see it. It was the only way to see it. I just want to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> right. uh, does everybody know what the feminist art programs were? You should explain. Yes or no? You should explain. Huh? Yes, yes, you all know. No. No, they, no, they don't. They don't. Okay. Um, I, I came up in L.A. in the 1960s, and uh, it was incredibly inhospitable to women. That's why this show is so amazing to me, because it's bringing back work that was either I had to destroy because I didn't get it, wasn't getting anywhere with it, or was, had been erased from the history of Southern California art, even though I was actually very active in the LA art scene. I was like the only woman who was taken seriously. I uh, was in a lot of major shows, like a uh, ten-part cylinder in the back was in L.A. County Sculpture of the 60s show, which probably had, I don't know, three women, maybe. Uh, but it was a big piece, and after I showed it, even though I was in that show, nothing happened, and I couldn't afford to store it, so I had to destroy it. Uh, Rainbow Pickett was in the first minimalist show at the Jewish Museum in uh, New York in a show called Primary Structures, 42 artists, hmm. three women. Hmm. 1966. Hmm. 1966 or six? Six. six. Hmm. Yeah, I did that in 1965, and um, they're always celebrating the history of the Primary Structure show all the time. Like in 2014, <laughs> They did a show at the Jewish Museum, kind of redoing a kind of contemporary primary structure show, and the best part of the show was a reconstruction of the old Jewish Museum with the primary structure in it. It was like a little model. It was great. There was Rainbow Picker. But then now this year they're doing a 50-year anniversary thing in T Magazine about the primary structure show. Actually, I had the funniest conversation with Jeffrey about because uh, this guy, Arthur Lubo, interviewed me for the T Magazine mm -hmm. article. He was all upset about, he wanted to find some artists who had gone to it. And like, I was like so young and not aware and kind of on the margins of the LA art scene that nobody told me that when you have, are in a big New York show, you're supposed to get on the airplane and go, and go <laughs> to the opening. So I told Jeffrey that story. He said, really? You know, if I knew you then and I was showing you, I would have paid your ticket and I would have gone with you. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, but then on the other hand, if I said, Jeffrey, you know, if that had happened, if I had a dealer who did that, the whole trajectory of my career would be different. Mm -hmm. And then Jeffrey said, yeah, but then there wouldn't be feminist art. <laughs> So I thought that was really funny. But anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, but Rainbow Picket is a piece that I did when they did that show at the Jewish Museum in 2014. I did a talk. I was invited to do a talk, and I talked about how Rainbow Picket broke my heart. Okay, over and over again. Because 
I was in a studio in Pasadena in the 60s with two other artists when the art world was completely different. We had a 5,000 square foot space for which we po paid in total $75 a month, $25 a month a piece, okay? Anyway, there was a very powerful curator on the West Coast then, Walter Hopps, mm -hmm. and he worked at the Pasadena Museum and he used to go around to all the studios of artists working in Pasadena. I was the only woman. And when I finished Rainbow Picket, Walter came to the studio, you know the story, mm -hmm. and he literally refused to look at it. Just, the story I'm gonna tell you is gonna tell you exactly what it was like in the 1960s, okay? So, it broke my heart. It was not, it was because of my, uh, my dealer then, Rolf Nelson, that it went to the Primary Structure Show but nothing happened, and I ended up having to destroy Rainbow Picket, although Ann Goldstein reconstructed it for a minimal future at L.A. Moka in 2004. But anyway, years later, I saw Walter. By then, I had published Through the Flower, and I talked about it in my first book, but I didn't mention him, but he had obviously read Through the Flower because we had breakfast in Washington. He said, I know you hated me, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he said, but you have to understand what it was like in the 60s. Women in the LA art scene were either groupies or artists' wives. So what was I to make of the fact that you were making art that was stronger than the men's? It was like I walked into a room and there was a woman pulling up her skirt, this is really the 60s, actually it's the 50s, rolling down her stockings and revealing her whatevers. I just had to avert my eyes. And then he looked at me as if I'm supposed to say, oh, Walter, I really understand. <laughs> the reason I'm telling this story is because it illustrates the fact of why I could get nowhere with so much of the work in this show. And in terms of CalArts, after a decade and a half of struggling in the LA art scene to get somewhere, I just like, I'm like, and seeing women who I'd gone to graduate school with drop out, mm -hmm. I thought, the hell with this. And I made such a, I made a really radical change. I went to Fresno and I set up a program for young women. I knew what I wanted to do, but I was very superstitious. I still am. I was very superstitious when I was young. I never wanted to talk about anything before I did it. And I'm still like that in a way, like I could never understand like my male peers, they would have people in their studio while they were in the middle of something, and they'd say, oh, yes, I'm working on this, and they'd explain it. I'm like, no. It's like when I did Pasadena Lifesavers, there are 15 of them in the series, and I put them at, it took a year and a half, and I put them in racks until I was completely finished with them. I didn't show anybody for the whole year and a half. But anyway, so I told the head of the art department in Fresno that I wanted to try and help young women become professionalized without having to do what I had done, which is like hide my gender in my work. And he thought that was nice, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I went there with the intent, with the intention of figuring out, like, could it be possible to make a female-centered art was there such a thing? Could there be a feminist art practice? And as part of that, I thought if I help young women make art from who they are as women without having to suppress their gender, maybe I could find my way back mm -hmm. myself. And so that was the beginning of, that was the first feminist art program. And Suzanne Lacey was in it. Where are you, Suzanne? She's right there. Suzanne Lacey was in it. I, ha I interviewed young women to be in it. And Suzanne 
said to me, so I asked him, like, why do you want to be in the program? And Suzanne says, well, I'm really a psychology major, but I want to be creative. And I'm like, oh, you're kidding me, out! <laughs> like that is... <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, she turned out to be my best student, right? So that, okay. But anyway, so... And she just had a retrospective I know. at SF, at Noma. SF Noma. Right, I know. Right. <laughs> Amazing show. Amazing show. So the first year, we're going to compress the first two questions between in this. In Can wait, I ask you one question? Yeah. Though? How how did you make the deal to switch from Fresno to Cal Arts? Who 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 was that with? Paul Brack. Right? No, it wasn't Paul. It was, well, it was Paul. He was the dean. Uh, so I I my students and I went off campus because I knew it was important to have a space. This is when you own. were at Cal this, Arts. No, this is in Fresno. Fresno, okay. We didn't intend to be off campus at, in, in Cal Arts. We intended to be on the campus, mm -hmm. but it wasn't ready, which is how we happened to do Woman House, because we were meeting in, in living rooms. But anyway, so I did this program, this intensive program for young women in Fresno. And I mean, I was only 30, okay? So it was like when I started the program, it was kind of like it exploded, you know, because there was all this young energy from these women who had a lot to say, but didn't want who, for whom, like one of my students, Nancy Yodelman, who wanted to be a sculptor, did not want to take sculpture courses at Fresno State because she would have had to make plaster blocks. And that is when I actually started understanding how curriculum, our curriculum, is inherently biased against women. Because what she wanted to do was work with clothing and needle and thread. Mm -hmm. And that was complete taboo mm -hmm. in those days. So, you know, once I gave them permission to be themselves, things just exploded. And, you know, I was young. And so, like, we invited a famous, New York feminist theoretician, T. Grace Atkinson, I invited to come to the studio. And so my like exuberant students, they're like, oh, we're gonna make these costumes. So they made these costumes and they developed these cunt chairs and the costume right. said C-U-N-T, right? So we go to the airport to pick her up and they're wearing their costumes and these Shriners get off the plane and they're my students. <laughs> see you, see you, see you! And, and I'm like, oh, oh my God, what have I started? And I had like no support, you have to realize, I had like no support. But I had met Miriam Shapiro in San Diego. She and Paul were teaching there and she was older than me. And she had come through abstract expressionism, which in New York, which was even less supportive of women than the LA art scene. And I just called her up cold and said, I've, you know, I really need someone to talk to. So then she came up to Fresno. She delivered the first talk she'd ever given on her work. Nobody wow. had ever invited her to talk about but her wasn't work. That, that was a big part of it too. Not only the imagery that was part, you know, and the subject matter that was part of the curriculum, but also just helping these women think themselves into being artists in terms of how do you organize your work? How do you talk about no, your work? What do you mean? How do you Slides, organize your you know, work? Forget it. We weren't there. It was like, how do you not say, hello, my name is Susie. How do you stand up and introduce yourself? Right. How do you build a wall in your studio? How do you work every day and regular hours? How do you have a studio of your own? Because like when right. Mimi and I went around LA in the 70s looking for women artists, I mean, they were behind their boyfriend's studios working in mm -hmm. kitchens, or they were like Lucita, Lucita. Hurtado was Lucita. working in a closet, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Mimi came and saw what I was doing, and then she and Paul offered me a job at Cal Arts. Now, I ne never planned to stay in Fresno. I mean, Fresno is like the navel of California. So I had never planned to, excuse me, I hope nobody's here from Suzanne. Fresno. Suzanne. <laughs> you know, I, I always wanted to go to, back to L.A., but I could not have done what I was mm -hmm. doing in L.A. So. I had to have time away to think. So I was ecstatic, my God, and they were gonna bring some of my students and Mimi was helping them put together their portfolios. And 
I was ecstatic. The first major art school in the country is going to provide us with a budget. Because, you know, we just funded everything ourselves. I mean, I and all the students paid $25 a month for the studio and for materials. And so here's Cal Arts. We're going to give you this huge space. We're going to give, we're bringing in an art historian to take your ragtag slide file that I had started by myself looking for slides by women artists and then my students helped. They were going to bring in our historian. They were going to develop the slide archive. They were going to give us a budget, oh my God, you know, and our own space. It was incredible, right? Well, of course, like everything that is too good to be true, it was too, it's good, too to good to be, to be true. true. But what happened was when we all came down here was that Cal Arts was not ready. They had been the school was in this old nunnery in Burbank while Valencia was being built, the campus, and so they, um, w there was no place for us to meet. So we were first meeting in everybody's living rooms. And then Paula Harper, the art historian, came up with this idea, why don't we do a project about the house, the home? And that turned into the first major, the first, female-centered installation in history called Woman House, Woman House, which has, <laughs> you know, this, which has gone on to be, like, there are Woman Houses all the time. I mean, you know, like, I get, you know, people right. do, like, men and women in Germany do a Woman House. You know, there was that show, Women House, mm -hmm. which, by the way, I was originally not in. Did you know that? It was only because of Susan Fisher Sterling at NEMWA that they decided they might want to put me in to the show commemorating the project, me and my students did. There you go. Anyway, so, but when we got on the campus, actually got on the campus, I hated it. Well, it's not the best building. <laughs> <laughs> the windows don't open. You so, know? but the thing is, is that there were huge amounts of archival material. Yeah, I know. Huge. Where did they go? And, the other thing about this that was so painful to me about it was, of course, my whole career has been about overcoming the erasure uh -huh. of women's history, of our achievements, of our cultural production, and to have that happen to Woman House. It's like, even when Pacific Standard Time happened, I was really shocked that of all the things they recreated, nobody ever recreated Woman House. Mm -hmm. Probably the single most important, mm -hmm. like Andrew Perchick says, Woman House was probably one of the most important yeah. installations of 20th century art, right? And so many of the artists are still around. Right, yeah. and nobody has ever proposed recreating Woman House, right. which tells you something about the ongoing lack of interest in what women do and did. So, okay, so now you come in into the 90s, and now you come into this terrain where we're but living. But you all are just like mythic, and we can't find a lot of information out about what had happened, which is crazy, right? Like, it's the same school we attended, and I can't find much out. I have know? a question about what, about the men. I mean, you, you mentioned now there are many, you know, male artists thinking about feminism and making women house and so on, but at the time, there were so many artists, I mean, I've been working with Larry Pittman, who talks about being at CalArts and being so influenced by the legacy of Woman House and the feminist art program, and that program, what did you do with the male artists who wanted to even enter the program? Was mm. there such oh, a... Oh, no, you must be it kidding. It wasn't that, yeah, yeah. Not then. I didn't, I didn't start thinking about whether the pedagogical methods I had developed in the 70s could also, mm -hmm. you know, be... Um, beneficial to men and artists of color until the 90s when Donald and I started te team teaching around the country and, you know, had men in the program, but not then, not in the 70s. The students, first of all, even me at that time could not be myself around men. It was just impossible. And um, if I couldn't, imagine young 19 and 20 year old students early in their formation, they would never have been able to open up. Because, you know, it's like one of the reasons the young women, I still call them the Fresno girls, and they're like, Judy, we're all in our 60s and 70s. Oh, yeah, but you'll always be girls to me. Um, you know, I mean, like when we would have discussions, and I'd go around the circle and ask them their opinions, and 
it took them a really long time to be able to formulate opinions. And I'd say, you know, why? And they said, nobody ever asked us what our opinions were. Mm -hmm. You know, they were used to being in mixed mm -hmm. groups where they were Susie and Nancy and so-and-so's girlfriend, and the men carried on conversations, mm -hmm. and they didn't participate. So, I mean, no, we were not, we were, we, w I had to deal with that level of, and I knew that. I knew that it had to do with what we used to call female will, but it's the construct of femininity that became the term that was preventing these young women from being able to realize their ambitions as artists, and that I would have to help them. I mean, I did that by myself in my studio. Just before we leave maybe these very early years, if you can just talk a little bit about the, the performance that is behind us, because this the happens. fireworks pieces. Yeah, the fireworks pieces, which you still continue to do, but yeah. which started at this early time. Late 60s. And talk about a little bit about the color in these, but also in the other works, too. Well, you know, when, when young women I, who interview me, they're always asking me, you know, like what it was like in the 60s. And, you know, when I tell them that the best compliment you could get was, you paint like a man, they're like speechless, of course, right? Um, but anything, everything that was any hint of my gender was unacceptable. My color, my imagery, um, in fact, even in Pacific Standard Time, Andrew told me that some of my male peers objected to the inclusion of one of the flesh gardens because it was too emotive, too uh, fleshy, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, even claiming my color, which uh, took me a long time for a while, However, I, I want to say that even though the 60s was really tough, I built my formal vocabulary, including my color systems. I did a lot of work on color in the 60s um, and exploring how color could be used to convey emotive states. And so I developed these color systems and I was using them in the, my domes. That this, the, what you have to realize is that in terms of this work, like there were 30 domes, there were 15 Pasadena Lifesavers, there were six flesh pans, there were five flesh cards. I mean, it was just, there were 30 fireworks pieces. But my point is that in my color systems that I used, so the domes were successive, uh, form domes that I then sprayed at different levels. So there was color at different levels. So it was kind of encased color, but it was laid out in a certain system like Passing and Lifesavers. And when I was right at the same time I was doing the domes that I started the fireworks and I laid out the fireworks exactly the same way. I laid out the color inside. So you could say it was kind of like, you know, hindsight, you can always understand your gestures. I didn't understand it at the time, but it was obviously, here I am about to go to Fresno, it was obviously a kind of gesture of liberation, okay? Mm -hmm. Liberating my color into the air. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is how it was so, now the great thing about the early, the late 60s and early 70s is, my friends and I would just go to Santa Barbara, I would buy color smoke, and we would light it. Everybody would do something. Either people would light flares, or they brought food, or they took pictures. You know, it was like my early collaborations. But I mean, it's like that piece on the bridge in Fullerton, it'd be impossible. But I did fireworks pieces in the National Forest, and then I did this trip up the northwest coast where I saw later on, I thought, oh my God, I put colored smoke in every orifice going up the northwest coast. <laughs> but then once I had, once we were here, 
in, back in LA with my students, then I started doing these, because I'd gotten very interested in goddess imagery, mm -hmm. and so then I started hmm. doing these fireworks pieces with and painted bodies and matching the color of the bodies with the, and you know, then for years and years, I, years and years, nobody knew anything about this work. Right. It's on, it only what started getting attention after P Pacific Center Time Performance Festival allowed me to kind of pick up where I left off. Mm -hmm. how, since you teach, Andrea, and um, how, how do you, I'm sitting here thinking like, how can we account for the fact that the audience and the art world, really, and the art market also is ready for this work now? And it wasn't ready for it then. I mean, the 60s were one thing. But what do you th what do you think of that? I mean, I look at these, you know, these performances, which look so amazing to me and so interesting. And yet, Connie, a this is ago, your business. I can't <laughs> figure this out at all, what the art world thinks is interesting and is not interesting. It's completely confusing. I mean, it's more about finally being historicized in some way. But there's yeah. still so many people that are not. Mm -hmm. So, and mainly women, you know, women's prices. It's particularly a lot of the feminists or artists who work more yeah. ephemerally, their works are nowhere near the prices, men. It's still totally unequal. Yeah. But I mean, it's exciting. I, I, I don't know. I mean, Can yeah. Can you hear her? Yeah, I think, I think that I, one of the things that's interesting to hear Judy talk about is this pedagogy, this like, you know, program she developed in the way that it seemed survivalist in so many ways. What came out of it was really life-changing for me. And I think that I've interpreted it in a different way, but it was, and then Suzanne picked it up and I worked a lot with Suzanne, but I had an epiphany it was that when I was recently at Judy's birthday party, her 80th birthday party. And um, it was totally, it, um, there, they have, they, you have a museum that you've opened, and it's in support no, it's of the- it's not a museum, it's a small, small alternative art space. Sp that it's in support, though, of the community. Yes, it's and, in support you of know, the community, right. At Judy's birthday, the new young mayor was there, and the first lady- He's, he, They're coming here for they're the They're coming opening. here for this, and <laughs> the old mayor is her hairdresser. And <laughs> the local restaurant, cooked all of the food for the party and it was but it was a very political event it was organized it wasn't just because the community was there this is a project that Judy had worked really hard on and that's also what I've learned from Suzanne so part of like bringing these women together was was about inventing real strategies of collaborative practices of shared authorship of community building of thinking about you know, working with communities as a form of art, of uh, ephemeral practices, site specificity, so much of what I think about and who I am, and also having a political voice, like, but also being able to have it be personal and political at the same time. So there was a lot of important, like, and then out of, after the um, feminist art program, then there was the women's building, too. Right, that was like you could learn. I don't know, Nancy Buchanan's here. You were in the women's building, right? You could like have your some. You know, there would be caring for the kids. You know, you were taken care of. There was you know child care. You could learn how to that fix was the not car. Me. That was Sheila. Sheila. But like this all came out of all of the, you know. There was all this video art, right? Like I think about right. video art is the first generation of video art coming out of feminism. Yes, yes. And, and early performance. And this too. was all happening in this city. So yeah. much of it, right? It was happening in New York too. But this was a locus for it. And these are all the things I've been drawn to and trying to learn about. But it seems like there's a historical am amnesia, which I think history is still dominated by patriarchy. It's not, it's not amnesia, it's erasure. Erasure, right? It's like erasure. Like throwing the archives of the feminist throwing art it program away. away. And not showing these artists and right. not writing these histories. Right. And I mean, really, it's a miracle that, this is what I say, my career is a miracle. I mean. Yeah, you know, I mean, like the art world tried to kill me and everything I ever did. Yeah. 
But not only that, it was really important when there started to be curators like Connie. Like when all the curators are men and all the collectors are men. And it wasn't just, now wait a second. It, I think it's really important, and this yeah. is gonna segue right into what just happened to you. I think it's really important to acknowledge that in the 70s, we completely recast the discourse incorrectly because mm -hmm. we made it all about gender, it, yeah. which means it is a lot about gender, but what it meant was we befriended a lot of women who were not our friends, and we alienated a lot of men who could were be, okay? Friends. Because mm -hmm. it was not just But I also want to say that I, when I use the word patriarchy, I think of patriarchy is a, is a politics. It's a, it's a political system, right. and men or women can be in service absolutely. of patriarchy. A absolutely, okay. absolutely. And in fact, women actually are the ones, women practice genital, genital mutilation on their daughters. Women bound their daughters' feet. Women have been the enactors of patriarchal values, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. that's really important because really it important. helps to explain what happened to me and what happened to you mm -hmm. when women turned on us, okay? Like when the dinner party was going to be shown at UCLA, Armin Hammer, the Women's Studies Department announced they were going to pick at the dinner party because it degraded women. And I'm like, by this time, the dinner party had traveled all around the world and been seen by a million people, all of whom recognized that the dinner party celebrated women and women's history. So how could all these feminist theorists in the 90s get it so completely wrong? Or how could a woman who was a victim of pa the patriarchal structure turn on you when you tried to bring to the heart of the art world the reality <laughs> of patriarchal violence against women. You have to tell everybody what happened no, to you, Andrea. No, I don't want to talk about it. You talk about it. It's important um, and it's instructive and it's instructive for women who want to make change to understand how women can be our own worst enemies. I mean, I think it's so complicated right now because um, I, I made a really controversial, monumental artwork where I took uh, an act, you know, I took the Me Too movement and basically made book reports about it, but I made it like monumental. Um, it's 170 photographs that are basic, or that are photographic prints that are mainly texts that tell the story. They have the name of the, the accused, mainly, you know, like, for instance, Epstein is on my list, you know, Harvey Weinstein, you know. Um, there, I've only done 170. I have a list of over 400 names. I can't keep up with them fast enough. Um, and the piece is so monumental now. The walls are freestanding, uh, 13 feet tall, and uh, I can't even remember, 66 or 67 feet long, and they're painted red, and the prints are red. And I took photos from social media, mainly sort of like, I would just download photos of the men, um, kind of like creepy photos, but I also posted some large actions that women did or online protests or like large text. And there was one woman who um, posted photos of herself with bruises. And um, as part of her, uh, you know, as part of the Me Too movement. And I mean, I worked on this piece for two and a half years. I think I was like so personally <laughs> invested in it. Um, it's so hard for me. It was so I hard. So it was like, just in June. It was yeah, just yeah. Ago. So like, she saw. I, it was like the hardest thing I've ever shown, 
because it was at Basel in Unlimited, and that's separate from the fair and its monumental works. And um, everybody in that room knew somebody on that wall, like taking power to the source and being like, look, we have to make change. And it's like this physical manifestation of patriarchy and of the Me Too movement. But she got really upset because I posted that photo. I reposted, I reprinted that photo. And I did not mean to re traumatize her, but it turned into this one of those huge social media attacks. It was really painful. I apologize, but I think, you know, that there is this thing right now where, first of all, art is powerful. To take something and make it physical, like I took something that's social media that's, that's like, ephemeral and I made it physical and it's a really powerful piece. It's probably the most powerful piece I'll ever make. But, um, and I want to say it took tremendous courage on Andrea's part to bring a piece like this into the heart of the Venice Biennale. It was, it was, it was the, the Basel. Basel, 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 one of the big <laughs> art fairs. But, and it um, gave, and this woman's attack on Andrea gave the art world a perfect excuse to avoid dealing with the content of the piece. <laughs> it was like I when, it, it was like when feminist theorists attacked the dinner party, it gave the art world a perfect opportunity to say, see, the dinner party is like bleh. Yeah, it's funny, it's like these two works have a real similarity between different histories. I mean, I apologize to her, I just want to say I apologize to her, but what I'm realizing is there's this really big difference between like, like we're just dealing with social media too. And as women, um, or as like feminists, like it's this thing, like you tell this really personal story for the survivors, you're telling this personal story, but you're doing it on social media. Right. And it's like so crazy because I understand the need to control that story, but at the same time, we've never dealt with such a, such a structure like social media before. And also, she posted it, and that sort of puts it into the public domain. I, I know, but I should have asked her permission. I think I should have asked yeah, her permission. Yeah, but you know what? Permission. Stop beating but, yourself up. Yeah, really. I know. I also think that... <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I have to do this. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thank you. I, I also think it's interesting that both works, the dinner party and your work, come out of this feminist tradition of work that is more socially engaged, that does reach out to the community that is based on an archive in Yeah, a way. it was an archive. And, so, yeah, and both, both of them are. also land into this territory of um, the problem of contemporary art in the bigger world, too. You know, whether it's Duchamp and like the found object in a way, which is what the dinner party was also, that image the image of the woman's body. I mean, you were also, it also comes out of a Duchampian tradition. It or does not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Connie, it does not. I, I saw that piece of Duchamp's in Philadelphia at the museum. I was horrified by it. It is the embodiment of the male gaze, and the dinner party challenges the male gaze, and it's, it about, it's about asserting female agency. Of course, yeah. And... I think one could say it also engages with that history of Duchamp in the 20th century, I think. But we can, we can, we can do that later. We could, we could debate that another time. I never related to Duchamp. I never did. Okay. okay. And also, I don't like I, it, the fact that the, that the PC became so famous for is a quintessentially male right. object, right. The, right. Urinal. No, the urinal. The urinal. Like, how many of us have ever used one? Right. <laughs> really? <laughs> Desperation. When the bathroom line is too long. I Sorry. Not easily, but not usually, right? <laughs> not usually. <laughs> Whoa, okay. No, I was mostly, I was also trying to get us a little bit away from the, the kind of bad feminist women subject, which is a huge subject, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I think, you because know, I, I want to tell you something. Not, it's I'm, not I'm, a subject that's very often addressed. No, agreed. And I, and I have a lot of strong things to say about it, too, but, and I, it's part of my lived experience also now. But, yeah, 
I just I also feel so like why do you want to get away from the conversation? Um, because I think there are other things to talk about. Okay, what do you want to talk Wait, about? Can I just say one more thing? I also see a shift. Like, you know, I think a lot about that. Like, I think there's a shift genera generationally in what feminist artists are thinking is okay and what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I talked to you about that uh, that Adrian Piper piece, which I just love. The the where you go into the box and you see, you know, that beating of. Um, What's Rodney, King. Rodney King. It's like such a powerful work. It's mm -hmm. such a political work. But then there's so much trauma, you yeah. know, for the family or for, for maybe even the black culture to have to see that over and over again. So our values are shifting, I think. And I feel like I'm and learning and thinking about that and right. trying to figure all of this stuff and who out. And the authority to tell these uh, yeah, stories, and who has the stories. Also. Yeah, and that's tricky too because, right. like, you know, I am a survivor, right, of of sexual harassment or sexual violence. So sometimes I think I was so, and Suzanne totally disagrees with me on this, but I was so deeply involved in, in projecting my myself onto these women's stories that maybe I didn't have enough subjectivity sometimes to like, because I was right. so deep into it right. because it was my story too. Actually, you know, that's very interesting because one of the things I actually had to deal with in Fresno and then ongoing with working with young women had to do with the s how hot a lot of their subject matter was yeah. and helping them establish aesthetic distance so they could actually work with that subject matter. I mean, God knows I've worked with lots of hot subject matter. And so, like, my new show that's about to open is, like, grief-inducing subject matter, like what we're doing. I mean, like, the, I'm, I'm about to open a show in Washington called The End, A Meditation on Death and Extinction that I worked on for six years. And, you know, that part about it that has to do with personal mortality mm -hmm. was easy compared to the part that deals with what we're doing to other creatures on this planet and the scale of it. I mean, to so this thing about how do you engage people so that they will look at subject matter that is so hot and so emotion inducing like for example there's one image that's about the finning of sharks okay so like mm. for sharks fit, fin soup in China uh, they fin sharks alive and then the sharks sink to the bottom of the ocean floor because they can't swim, they can't eat, they can't hunt, and they suffocate to death. This is done to 100 million sharks a year. Okay, so how do you help people look at subject matter that is so loaded? This is actually where I believe, I actually believe this is the function of beauty in art. Mm -hmm. That beauty, and I used all my skills to make images that were so incredibly visually gorgeous that it would allow people time to think about the subject matter. Because, I mean, so I had to do a lot of that over the years with my students, or too. Or it just mm -hmm. slows down the judgment. You know, the aesthetics and the facture, the way it's made, it kind of slows down the judgment, so maybe they can change their it, minds. It, it allows a path. Yes. Which, right. See, I, right. think, I think this is something, and you know, when, when people say our art is political, it always makes me furious, because if you think about all this, okay, so there's a big article about Richard Serra. I see. Uh, 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 last Sunday's New York Times, right? It's all about the tonnage, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it is like, it is like the, the embodiment of the construct of masculinity. Tough, forbidding, imposing, it kills, powerful, it kills people. strong. What's that? That's what a man's supposed to be, right? So what are you telling me? that our work is political and his isn't. His is the carrier of patriarchal values. We only have two minutes more. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> our, our timer just gave me the signal.
<laughs> Do we want to call out any artists in the audience, maybe? Um, sure. Yeah. Who do we want to call out? Um, there's some amazing artists in the audience. There are. Where'd Mary Weatherford go? I just Weatherford want to say, go? Mary Weatherford's here. Is she gone already? Yeah. Oh, she just snuck out. Oh, she um, did. Okay. Nancy Buchanan. Oh, really? Oh, so um, Suzanne Lacey. Who else is here? I don't know. Two two women who there were involved. Also in some, there's also Sarah Thornton. Sarah Thornton. Art writer. writer. And Will Simmons. And there are wonderful dealers who've been incredibly supportive of women artists, Jeannie greenberg Roatan and Jessica Silverman. Suzanne Vilmetter. Suzanne Vilmetter. And Christine Kim is in the audience, an amazing <laughs> feminist curator. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, I also wanted to say thank you. I've spent the day crying today, I guess. Um, I am so moved because to do this, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, we were given um, money to donate to organizations and I just want to thank you all so much because today I received a check for $10,000 to give to, I'm giving to Annunciation House and they are the people who are, they are one of the organizations in El Paso that is reuniting families and is caring for the families who are separated. So I am so excited to send this check to them, and thank you for letting, thank you for this. That's very special. Thank you. I'm giving my check to Through the Flower Art Space. There's a woman who's the director of Through the Flower Art Space that arose out of our communities. Donald and I live in a small town in New Mexico. New Mexico suffered greatly from the recession, especially the small rural towns like where we live. And our town wants to develop an arts corridor on the street where we live and where the Th Through the Flowers building is. And our, they came to us and asked us if we would anchor the art, the art corridor and our mayor there was like this whole right-wing assault that actually made it to the New York Times. Ah, my God, Berlin in the New York Times. Anyhow, um, so our mayor gave his entire sal year salary to start the fundraising, and our whole community came together and raised the money to renovate the space. And the mother-in-law of the mayor is the director of the space, and she has been, she does the tours in the space. And we have been watching what art can do because, in fact, I'm having my first retrospective in the spring at the De Young in May. Yeah. And, and when we go to do docent training, I'm actually going to bring Lena Malcolm because she's been doing these tours and people are spending between two and five hours in the space. Wow. Which is a demonstration that if art has is if art has meaning to the viewers and is about subjects they care about and they're helped to engage with that, you do not need fancy technology <laughs> and digital uh, like manipulations or yoga classes to get people to come to the museum. <laughs> so thank you from the Through the Flower Art Space. Okay, are questions, we doing questions? Right? Yeah, are we doing questions? Okay. Well, got that out. Does anybody have a question? You could have a question? Could you introduce, could you stand up and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Liana. This was very, very moving for me. You know, I grew up in Germany and I came to the United States in 1985. I have an aunt who's an artist, she's 93 years old, mm -hmm. and it's the first public conversation that I've heard um, that women are supporting women in such a beautiful way, and it's, it's really moving to me. I'm sitting here with tears in my heart, and what moves me to ask you a question is, what are we doing about the art that's being lost in our children? The schools in America are not really supporting children 
to become artists, to nurture them, to have schools of life where they can be nourished. And parents are kind of falling in line with schools because the public system isn't really doing it. So as a mother and as a grandmother, I would love to know what, what can we do or what's your suggestion? How can we just plant a seed? I'm an artist, but many of us aren't. Many of us who are mothers and sisters and aunts and grandmothers are not as gifted and as lucky to have all that creativity at our fingertips. So how can we give birth to it in the next generation and the generation after that? I think it's just the answer should start from like your, you know, like a museum perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, I can talk about one very small program that we have that I that I think should be a pilot program for, you know, many museums um, of a certain scale, I suppose, which is that we, in answer to the, in some small answer to this problem, have a program where we bring school kids um, and we work with, um, I think it's two schools a year, to bring the kids for a week-long intensive, their entire program happens at the museum for an entire week, which is really a lot if you think about it. You know, they suspend their classes, they come, they bring their lunch, they, we get the transportation money, all these things, and it's for kids um, in public schools where, the, where there is no longer any art program. And the, the letters that we get, the drawings that they make, um, the video responses to what they're seeing are incredible. What they can do with that week-long immersion is amazing. I mean, it's exactly what you're speaking to, and it's worth a whole year of art education in some ways, although, of course, we wish it were, was longer, you know, and it's hard for the kids to take the time out of the curriculum, but if we, if we could grow it, we could do more schools and so on. And it's, um, it's become, it, my colleague Teresa Soto uh, started it, and it's become a kind of um, model in the art education community, but it's you know it's one small it's one small thing, and it's hard because I think museums in many ways are asked now to fill a lot of mm. these gaps, and we can do a lot, and it's really interesting now to think also with artists about how to through the museum do public engagement work, do t socially engaged work, but you know it's a small fraction of what the need is. So. You, we have to vote. We for, need to. We need to vote for louder. leaders. Yeah. We need to vote for leaders who believe in education as a human right and believe that critical creative thinking matters from the very local level all the way up to the very national level. And that's the only way it's gonna change. We have to make it change. That's a very good answer. Okay, other questions? She's from Canada. My name's Diane, and I grew up in a little mining town in Quebec, mm -hmm. and I went to Toronto, I think it was 1982, and the dinner party was there. I had never seen anything like it. I bought the poster and framed it, and I've had it all these years, <laughs> and my Ooh. brother's girlfriend was a feminist art critic. At the time, I didn't know what that meant, and there was, I, 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 I couldn't imagine how you, as a woman, could conceive of this work and even think about putting all those historical women together at the dinner party and to show you how I grew up it was like I didn't know you were allowed to do that and that your work and reading about it helped me conceptualize art I'm a numbers person I don't know from art but I go to the museums all the time and I love it and it speaks to me but but there's something about what you did that as a young woman growing up allowed me to start imagining what art could do and what women artists could do. And I wonder what you have to say to sort of the young you today, that 19-year-old, 20-year-old who's thinking about art school and wondering how it all can happen and how it all come together, what your two, the two artists are thinking about how you would speak to that person. Thank you very much. I don't know how you... I, I think it's a real challenge for young artists now. Uh, when I came up in the LA art scene, nobody ever thought they were going to make any money. And uh, it was not about money. It was not about the market. And it, it's like people, at, when I get interviewed, people are always asking me if I'm pissed off that it took so long for the art world to turn around. I'm like, no. I had like 50 years of uninterrupted art making. 
that is something that young artists, it's, true. I, it's inconceivable. And they get picked up, swallowed up, and spit out at an accelerating rate. And what I would tell any young artist is find your own voice. And until that happens, stay the fuck away from the art market. <laughs> and that is a big task, to find one's yeah. own voice. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm more concerned. I always, you know, I, ha I had amazing teachers like Charles Gaines and Michael Asher and, you know, uh, Millie Wilson. They would always talk about the importance of t teaching. Like, no matter what happens, you always have to teach. And lately, teaching is becoming unethical for me because how do I allow my students to have fifty to a hundred thousand dollars of debt when they leave? Yeah, well, or two hundred. So, or two. Yeah, or, but once the once the loans start accruing, you know, it can go up to three three hundred. I mean, it's crazy. Three hundred thousand dollars. So I don't know what to do other than to start thinking about alternative forms of education that we need to develop or we need to, until the government decides to forgive student debt and make afford, you know, affordable, no interest loans. Why are we not giving low interest? Why isn't education free? I don't know. So we live I in a capitalist society. Now I know, you know but that. like I don't know. That's I think education that's should a, be that's free. That's a fantasy of the left. Well, I know, about. but well, but we have community colleges. Should. Like, what if this kind of education is in community colleges? What if it should be affordable? It's not affordable. You can't strap. I have one assistant whose debt is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Okay, this, how do you do this? So it, something's got to change. How do we do this? But, I mean, but it's like some of these questions have to do with like, how do you solve problems that are way bigger than the individual? So even right. that question about teaching, like, and about art, art in the schools. Mm -hmm. And okay, so Donald and I live in New Mexico. Actually, we were talking last night to Tony Ressler, who's involved at LACMA and trying to do mm -hmm. like programs for children and all that stuff. Oh, LACMA does so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, in New Mexico, uh, for years, Donald and I could not understand how we could have gotten perfectly good public school education and New Mexico public schools are not even graduating half the kids. I mean, kids can't read, they can't do math, they're just like, that, you know. So we had a state senator from our town who happened to be the head of the New Mexico, the state legislature, Senate, and his wife was a teacher. And so we used to go to their like Christmas padrone parties because that's the political structure in New Mexico. And one time, Donald and I asked Lynn, like, what is it with these schools? I mean, we're just not getting this, okay? So she described something to us that we had never thought about, which is the kids come to school, nobody has ever read to them, mm -hmm. nobody spends time with them, they don't even know English, a lot of them, they haven't had anything to eat, They've pro yeah. a lot of them have been abused, one parent is maybe in jail. The other parent doesn't even have a high school level diploma. And these kids come to the schools and then teachers are expected to solve social problems mm -hmm. that are at such a huge level in terms of the breakdown of our social structure right. and our social net and our responsibility to the citizens of this country. And art is one piece of that. The lack mm -hmm. of art education is one, is one piece yeah. of this huge societal problem. It's like when I was at Miami Basel, there was a whole like panel about, you know, I, I wasn't on it, but I had, was before a panel I did. Uh, about the inequity in prices for women, and so carried over into the mm -hmm. conversation I had, and this woman asked a question about the inequity of prices of, for women artists, and it was the same thing. We live in a culture, we live in a world that doesn't value what women do. One person 
cannot, yeah, you can try and make a difference. You can try and make change, which I've devoted my life to. Mm -hmm. But it's important to understand. It's like, you know, eating uh, kale is not going to solve the world's problem with energy and too many, you know, people and too much cattle. And it's like, so how do you find a path I do where that you too. feel I like you kale. can actually make a contribution? <laughs> right. But you can really make a contribution. Yeah. I mean, on any of these levels, it's, and what can art do? And what is art's role in this? And what can we do as artists? I think those are really big questions, and they're questions that are by and large avoided in the art world. It's like, how do I get a gallery? You know, put your slides together. And yet, I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying, Judy, but, and yet it has actually changed a great deal though, right? Especially mm -hmm. for women, maybe not especially, but for women artists. I mean, certainly the women of that course, you it would teach be, it would be are entering for me a completely say, different yes, art world. Yes, it would be insane for me to say. Right. It's, it's, like, it's like I keep saying this. You know, I love going on Instagram and seeing all these sites, Club Clitoris, Vagina China, women, you know, like <laughs> celebrating their bodies, big red clit. I mean, like, really? It would have been inconceivable when I was young. So it would be insane to say things that hadn't changed. And in some ways, things have changed. Right. And so that's where we started, right? Have things right. changed? We did a, yes, things have changed. There's still farther to go, though. That's, that's what it. I would like to say. And There's a long way to go. In fact, it's much more granular now, and it's much more sort of subterranean, the work that mm -hmm. we all have to do, I think. Not me. I'm just going to keep fighting right out in the open. Well, <laughs> that too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's quit. I'm tired. I'm old. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. and especially to Judy, Andrea, and Connie. And speaking about education, we forgot to mention that we have Otis students as our guests here, yeah. fine arts students. We're very anxious to be here, so welcome. And I think you've all had a firsthand experience this evening of seeing and hearing and witnessing what real feminist social activists are about and thank you so much for all of your hard work and for your continuing work and your continuing efforts and we are delighted to have been able to host you here today and experience your show and introduce you to everyone and please please come back again very soon <laughs> I love you, <laughs> thank you